to take an overview of the four Gospels. And what we're going to do, uh, Cliff is going to start off and talk about Matthew, and then we'll have a five minute stand up short break, because these pews get rather hard, right? So you can get up and walk around, and we, anyway, we have to change the camera and various other things. And then, and then Andrew's going to go through Mark's Gospel with us, and then we'll have some refreshments, a cup of tea, and various other things like that. And then at four o'clock, Sylvia's going to go through Luke with us. And then we'll have another quick five minute stand up at uh, approximately 4.30. And then Willie will go through John with us. And then we'll have another longer break for some more refreshments. And then at about 5.30, Willie will contrast the Gospels and see what's uh, different about them. And then after another short break, I'll finish off the day and I'll talk about the similarities in the Gospels. Okay, so that's, that's what we're going to do. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Cliff, who will take us through Matthew's Gospel. Okay? Thank you. Well, another welcome, and it's uh, good to see such a dense crowd, as <coughs> Fred Divine has been wont to say. Um, right, so Matthew's Gospel in... Uh, 20-25 minutes, a bit like putting a quart in a pint pot, and if you do think I'm kind of talking fast, well I know we've probably all got homes to go to tonight. Uh, it is a tall order to even give an overview. Um, I won't be looking at it chapter by chapter, I've picked out some major topics which are Jesus the King, the Kingdom, the parables, Old Testament prophecies fulfilled, the miracles, the law, and the mission of the twelve. So, seven topics, perfect number in scripture, allegedly. And so, um, first of all, I'd just like to give a very brief summary of the content. Uh, Starts with the genealogy and the birth of Jesus Christ. Chapter 1, verse 1 through to 2, 23. Then the short few verses about the ministry of John the Baptist in chapter 3, 1 to 12. Then the baptism and temptation of Jesus. And he moves then to Capernaum, where he does a lot of his preaching. That's chapter 3, 13 to 4, 16. Then we've got this... Uh, time period marked out by Matthew in uh, chapter 4 verse 17. It's the proclamation of the king and the kingdom, I think is a good heading for this section from chapter 4 through to chapter 16. And the time period that Matthew tells us is from that time on Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And then the next section, another longish section, is the rejection of the king and the kingdom. And another time period, clearly marked by Matthew, says from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life and that's up to chapter 26 and after that we've got the arrest, the trial, burial and resurrection of Jesus and finally the great commission in chapter 28. Um, right, now one thing I have gleaned since I last did this talk um, is that I've read a manuscript from someone who's been looking at the Gospels and he said this, it's the conviction of this writer that the events recorded by Matthew are in chronological order with the exception of a couple of verses he's picked out from chapter 21. He thinks they must just be a few verses out in chronological order. So it's his conviction that the events recorded in Matthew are in chronological order. Now, 
because I can see these two time periods that he mentions in chapter 4 and chapter 16, I think there may be some uh, truth in what that writer was convicted of, the fact that it was in order. From that time on, Matthew says, and later he says, from that time on, and we've got all these events that happened during those time periods, the proclamation of the king of the kingdom and the rejection of the king and the kingdom. So by way of a, a brief introduction, the Gospel of Matthew, as all the Gospels, tells the good news that Jesus is the Saviour, the Messiah, through whom God fulfilled the promise that he made to his people in the Old Testament. And the Gospels therefore continue to unfold God's plan, which began in Genesis and which will finish with the events of Revelation. The Jewish nation, Israel, is central to God's purposes and has been since the call of Abraham. Apart from, possibly you might describe the current dispensation from the period after the end of Acts when salvation was sent to the Gentiles and they will hear it. So the next section is headed Jesus the King. Matthew presents Jesus as the King who's come to reign in his kingdom. And to this end he uses various words and expressions more than the other gospel writers. The Lord's genealogy begins in Matthew 1.1, Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And whereas Matthew uses the expression son of David nine times of Christ, Mark and Luke use it only two or three times each. Uh, what God promised in 2 Samuel chapter 12, we read, when your days are over and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, who will come from your own body, and I will establish his kingdom. Your house and your kingdom shall endure forever before me, and your throne shall be established forever. And in Isaiah's prophecy, words that we usually hear at Christmas time, for unto us a child is born in chapter 9, and then it continues, verse 7, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And uh, in chapter 11 of Isaiah, it says, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, from his roots a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding. Jeremiah again, he prophesied, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up to David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. And these prophecies Concerning Jesus are confirmed by none other than Paul in the New Testament letter to the Romans. Uh, sorry, before that in Acts chapter 13 he says, From this man, that is David, from David's descendants, God has brought to Israel the Saviour Jesus as he promised. Paul testifying in the book of Acts to the fact that Jesus was the man promised as being a descendant of David. And in, Act, in Romans 1.3 he said his son who as to his human nature was a defendant, a descendant of David. Uh, other occurrences of the, the phrase son of David in Matthew are chapter 9 verse 27 <coughs> when uh, he healed two blind men. In chapter 12 it was said by the crowd when Jesus healed a demon possessed man. In chapter 15 the Canaanite woman referred to Jesus as son of David. Uh, in chapter 20, two blind men outside Jericho. Chapter 21, the crowds when he entered Jerusalem. And chapter 21 again, the children shouted in the temple area. 
And finally, even the Pharisees themselves answered a question of Jesus with the terms, Son of David. And the first Gospel begins, as we've seen, with a reference to the Son of David. The last book in the New Testament ends with a reference to the Son of David. Revelation 22.16 says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and offspring of David and the bright and morning star. <coughs> Is this a coincidence? It occurs at the beginning of Matthew and at the end of Revelation. Is it a coincidence? I think not, since the Bible is God's word. Mm -hmm. Matthew records in chapter 2, verses 1 to 12, the visit of the Magi. Uh, Mark, Luke and John don't have that in their Gospels. They come to Jerusalem after Jesus was born in Bethlehem and ask, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? Now this disturbed King Herod, of course, because he was the king. Uh, all Jerusalem with him, it says, were disturbed too. And uh, he asked the chief priests and teachers of the law where Christ was to be born. They said, in Bethlehem in Judea, because the prophet Micah has written, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be a shepherd of my people Israel. And later on in the Gospel, chapter 21, Jesus sends two disciples to get a donkey and her colt, and we're told it fulfilled Zechariah 9, 9. Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And although done in mockery, the title they put above the crucified Christ was nevertheless true. This is the King of the Jews. Okay, we move on to the next topic, the Kingdom. The expression, the Kingdom of Heaven, occurs 32 times in Matthew, but not once in the other Gospels. So what is the Kingdom of Heaven? I'm going to quote from a, a book written by uh, Stuart Allen, obtainable from the Berean Publishing Trust. The book's called The Kingdom of God in Heaven and on Earth. This is what he says about the Kingdom of Heaven. He says, the sphere of the Kingdom of Heaven is defined, defined in the Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And further exam exemplified by the Lord in the Sermon on the Mount, he quotes from Psalm 37, The meek shall inherit the earth. The kingdom of heaven is the kingdom which is from heaven. The kingdom is the realisation of the promise in Deuteronomy, the days of heaven upon the earth. The kingdom of God, another expression that's used in the other Gospels, is wider in scope than the kingdom of heaven. It's as universal as the sovereignty of God over the whole creation, which includes heaven as well as earth. And in the Gospels, the two phrases are sometimes used interchangeably. As we look at Matthew 4.17, which is where um, Matthew has his first time period mentioned. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. But what we read in Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, verses, verse 15 of Mark, he has the words, um, The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. So, pretty identical to Matthew, but instead of kingdom of heaven, he's used kingdom of God. <coughs> there are other examples between Matthew and Luke. 
The reason why they can be used interchangeably in the Gospels is because the lesser of the two, that is the kingdom of heaven, is included in the greater, the kingdom of God. So that's what Mr. Allen had to say on that subject. Hope it's in, you know, enlightened you a little bit. Time doesn't permit a fuller examination of this interesting subject, say, to say that the long-awaited kingdom of the Old Testament was now near with the present of the king in the midst of Israel. That's why he preached. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. The king was there. But did the death of Jesus mean the end of the preaching of repentance for the kingdom was near? Yeah. The king was dead. Did that mean they, were never, they weren't going to preach repentance because the kingdom was near? Had the kingdom now gone far away? Well, we don't have to look much further because if we look at the first pages of the book of Acts, we find that Jesus, the risen Lord Jesus, is with his disciples and they ask him the question, uh, Acts 1 and verse 6. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? So they still wondered, oh, he's alive now and he's with us. Are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he replied, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. So he could say, he, he couldn't say to them yes or no. He just said, it's not for you to know the dates. But later on, uh, Peter preaches, and in chapter 3, he, he's preaching repentance to them. And he says, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Christ who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. He must remain in heaven, which is where he'd gone in Acts chapter 1, the ascension. He must remain in heaven until the time comes for God to, there's the word, restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets <coughs> etc so what peter was saying look you still need to repent and the king will come back he could have come back in the book of acts and then we find that um, he didn't come back in the book of acts and paul in rome announced that god's salvation had been sent to the gentiles and they will listen. The return of Christ is in abeyance, but one day the prophecies of his coming will be fulfilled. And as Zechariah 14 says, the Lord will be king over the whole earth. On that day there will be one Lord and his name, the only name. Okay, moving swiftly on. Parables. Um, who can tell me where the first occurrence of the word parable is in the New Testament? It's not as early as you think. Matthew 13 verse 3. That's nearly halfway through. Matthew. First occurrence of the word parable. Surprised. Yeah, maybe. It says there, then, it says, then, he told them many things in parables. And parables were perhaps nothing new. I mean, well... In the Old Testament, there is a quote that uses the word parable in the King James Version. may not be totally irrelevant, but Numbers 23, 7 in the AV says, He, Balaam, took up his parable. Uh, might not be the best translation of the word, but it's there way back in the Old Testament anyway. And in Matthew 13, where we first meet parables, uh, we read, Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. So was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. That's actually from the Psalms. <coughs> After he'd given the parable of the sower, uh, the disciples had to ask him, why do you speak in parables? 
And he replied, The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and he will have an abundance, but whoever does not, whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. This is why I speak to them in parable. Bit of a tricky thing to get your head around, possibly that. But the main thing is uh, that after that, Jesus quotes from Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 to 10, which is the most quoted Old Testament prophecy in the New Testament. And he says, For this people's heart has become calloused, they hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes, otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. We will find the reason for this quote from Isaiah if we look back, and also the reason for the parables, if we look back to the previous chapter in Matthew, chapter 12, if you looked at Matthew 12, verse 6, verse 41 and 42, you see that Jesus is claiming to be, which he was, he was greater than the temple, greater than Jonah, greater than Solomon. He was greater than a priest, greater than a prophet, greater than a king. And yet, he was despised and rejected. The parables were not then... Uh, what many people today think used to make the teaching plainer, uh, they were made to veil the teaching from the majority. That's why he spoke in parables and that's why he spoke in parables from Matthew 13 onwards after he'd been subject to this rejection in the previous chapter. It is fairly apparent that was why. Very quick summary of all the parables. There's not so many as you might think in Matthew, actually. You get this whole block in chapter 13, there's eight of them. Uh, so the weeds, the mustard seed, the yeast, the hidden treasure, the pearl, the net, and the scribe. And then you don't get another one until chapter 18. That, there's two there, the lost sheep, the unmerciful servant. Then there's another one in 20, the workers in the vineyard. Then we get the two sons, the tenants the wedding banquet, the ten virgins, and the talents. And that's it. So 16 altogether in Matthew. I was surprised when I got that fact together. But surprising. Okay, next topic, Old Testament prophecies fulfilled. Matthew uses expressions like, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken, nine times. That which was spoken, or it was spoken, 14 times, and they occur nowhere else, those expressions. All well, the gospel writers, not interested. <laughs> um, so, I would suggest that he does this to demonstrate that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah, revealed in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. A um, couple of examples, just briefly. The first fulfillment in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 22 23. Okay. Matthew 1 22. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son. They will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Again, familiar with that Christmas time reading Isaiah chapter 7. Um, and plenty more all through in, in Matthew's Gospel. Matthew 2, um, various in Matthew 2 actually, from Micah, Ozeer and Jeremiah and Isaiah, all in Matthew 2, um, chapter 4, chapter 8 from Isaiah. Uh, the events of the crucifixion, clearly seen in Psalm 22, verses 1, 6, 7, 8, 14 to 18. And remember all that took place on short space of time, on one day. Read Psalm 22, you will get details of everything that happened when Christ was on the cross. All these are more uh, examples of how God's word is inspired. These prophets could say things that happened. The miracles. Uh, 
We didn't look at this verse, but Matthew 8.17 was a fulfilment of Old Testament prophecy about Jesus being able to uh, perform a miracle. But we'll, we'll have a look at it now. Uh, Matthew 8.17. Um, here we are. Let's have a look. Let's say... This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and carried our diseases. Matthew 8, 17. And um, the Jews at the time of Jesus' earthly ministry would be familiar with other words spoken by prophets which were fulfilled by the miracles he performed. Uh, in Isaiah 35, 4 and 6. Your God will come. He will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened, the ears of the deaf will stop, the lame will leap like a deer, the tongue of the dumb will shout for joy. So any Jew knowing his Old Testament should immediately have been saying, oh, that's the Messiah, yes, the Messiah's here. Mm -hmm. The following miracles are recorded in Matthew, but no time to, well just whisk through them, no time to talk about them individually. Chapter 4, it says he heals every disease and sickness among the people. Chapter 8, several, the man with leprosy, the centurion's servant, he heals many, including Peter's mother-in-law, calms the storm, demon-possessed man. Chapter 9, a paralytic, a dead girl, a sick woman, heals the blind, the dumb, every kind of disease and sickness. Man with a withered hand, healed all the sick, demon-possessed man. So it goes on and on, large crowds here, chapter 19, two blind men, blind in the lane, the fig tree with us, that was his only miracle of judgment, and then his death and resurrection, another miracle. Surely, we would say, these would convince the Jewish nation that Jesus was their Messiah, but no, a quote from the ending of the parable of the rich man and Lazarus where it says if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead said Jesus the law the law of Moses was in operation during the Lord's earthly ministry the gospels is a continuation of the Old Testament people were supposed to obey the law Moses in the Old Testament was still supposed to obey the law of Moses in the gospel period. During his earthly ministry, many believe today that Jesus deliberately broke the law because he was, he was radical, you know, he couldn't turn the world upside down, therefore he didn't need to keep the law of Moses. But no, he, he, he didn't go around breaking the law of Moses, he, he distinctly kept the law of Moses. It's way off the mark to think like that. He states, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfil them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter nor the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. And when the Pharisees accused him of breaking the law, he wasn't breaking the law, he was breaking their traditions, which had been additions to the law. So, they just, you know, were making the law more difficult for the people, really, to, to obey these things. Examples are found in Matthew 12, when they were picking the ears of corn to eat. Matthew 15, where the Pharisees said, the disciples don't wash the hands before they eat. In this case, the Pharisees clearly say, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? Mark adds a very useful comment about the traditions of the elders in chapter 7, verses 3 to 4, but we won't look at that. And later on, of course, Jesus in chapter 23 of Matthew launches a horrendous attack on them. Woe to you! Woe to you! Because, well, what they were doing, they weren't doing their job properly. <coughs> Verses 15, 23, 24, 25, 27 and 33 of Matthew 23, all these woes. And he said he'd come to fulfil the law, but that, that could mean he came, came to fill full the law. In the servant, Sermon on the Mount, he frequently says, 
You have heard it said, but I tell you, and then he expands on what Moses said. We'll just look at, uh, <coughs> just look at, no, no, I've not got time to look, but ch read chapter 5 of Matthew where he says it quite a lot about you have read but I say. Um, and further comments on Matthew 5 verse 17 to 20, uh, you need to see Mike Penny's book, <laughs> 40 Problem Passages, uh, where he discusses, discusses those verses and uh, also in chapter 7 and 8 he's got more discussion on the Sermon on the Mount because they're sort of hard sayings of Jesus if you like that we today can easily and lots of people today take them to mean that it applies to them today but probably it needs careful study to look at. Uh, right, lastly the mission of the twelve. Matthew 10 records sending out the twelve disciples and it says he gave them authority to drive out evil spirits, to cure every type of disease and sickness, just as Jesus was doing himself. He also gave them these instructions. <coughs> Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, preach the message, the kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons, freely you have received, freely give. Do not take along any gold or silver or copper in your belts, take no bag for the journey or extra tuning, sandals or staff, for the worker is worth his keep. And the most interesting verse among them there says, do not go among the Gentiles. And later Jesus told the Canaanite woman, I was only sent to the lost sheep of Israel. Why did Jesus and the disciples have such a restricted ministry? Well, I hope what I've already said about the king and the kingdom has thrown some light on this sometime, somewhat forgotten aspect of Jesus' mission. Paul, writing to the Romans, chapter 15, sums up the answer to the problem. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truth to confirm the promises made to the patriarchs so that the Gentiles may glorify God for his mercy. The Jews were always going to be the means of blessing to the Gentiles. Always in God's plan, even in the Old Testament. Mike considers that to uh, Matthew 10, 5-7 in problem passages taken into account who, what, when, where, why. And if I just close with Mark's application of that explanation, it says this, it's essential for us to appreciate Christ's death on the cross was a sacrifice for the sins of the world, for all nations. For Every person, for you and for me. However, if we wish to understand the Gospels, we must realise that his ministry was to Israel, that he was a servant of the Jews, his purpose was to confirm the promises made to the patriarchs. Those patriarchs were Jews. And the majority of these promises were to do with special blessing for Israel. Thank you. Do you have spiritual indigestion? <laughs> I'll have a quick whip through Matthew. Jesus is the king, he's the kingdom, they're the parables, there's his Old Testament prophecies fulfilled. There's all these miracles, there's the law, the mission of the twelve. Thanks Cliff for pulling all that information together. Um, maybe you can't hold it all in your head, but maybe when you go back and you want to read Matthew, you'll, you'll read Matthew thinking in a bit different way which you thought about before. Here is Matthew writing to Jews about the king of the Jews. Thank you. Thank you.